run people off. You know, and, and so, the, because see, here's the deal. People don't get mad at God. They can't get mad at God. So they don't get mad at the message. They get mad at the messengers. Everybody gets mad at the preacher. And so preachers don't want to talk about money because nobody likes them to get mad at us. And nobody wants to run people off. And nobody wants to do that. So we just kind of want to stay quiet. Right? A lot of people don't want to talk about money because you've heard preachers who don't seem to mind talking about money. And they seem to like talking about money. And they abuse the topic. Come on. Amen. Some of you, you ever watched any TV evangelists? I'm telling you right now, whoa, God told me, whoa, right now, that if you give me some money, you're going to have a Lexus in two days. Whoa, somebody, come on, somebody. How do they do that? That hurts my throat. <laughs> I think. <sighs> I'm serious. Don't it remind me to never do that again. So anyway, they, oh, man. <laughs> The truth is, it's not that easy, and you know it's not that easy, and it's not that it's not that good, and they're gonna pray over, and, gonna, and so after a while, and maybe you went to a church where the preacher's always begging for money and begging for money and begging for money. If you've been here, you know that's not the way we are. So it makes people nervous. Some people get nervous because you didn't grow up in church, you don't know very much about the Bible, and you just kind of intuitively feel like these are two subjects that should never be mixed. You have compartmentalized things that this is Christianity, this is finances. This is the world of man. This is the world of God. This is the world of business. This is the world of spirituality. And we don't mix the two of those things together. And I just want to tell you, and I don't mean this very, I don't mean this arrogant or condescending or nothing, but that is not consistent biblically. That, that, that may be what you feel intuitively. It may be something that you believe is true, but it's not true according to God's word. And, and I'm going to try to show you that. And I'm trying to show you. And then some of you, you're like, you know what the Bible says. And you know preachers ought to talk about it, but you just don't like him talking about it. You don't like him talking about it. You don't want to be around it because here's the deal. You know what the Bible says, but you just don't want to obey it. And it's too hard. It's too disciplined. And so every time the subject comes up, you feel guilt. You feel shame. You want to go away. And you see, you rationalize it. Well, God don't really expect me to be that way because I don't have any money and I'm poor. And Let me just say, how many of you live in a house that does not have a dirt floor? Raise your hand good and high. All right, how many of you eat at least once a day? Hold your hand up good and high. How many of you have meat at least once a day? Raise your hand. How many of you have transportation either that you drive or you got way around? Somebody would take you places. Then you're in the top like 20% of the wealthiest people in the world. So when you're reading the Bible and it says, woe to you rich people because you may not get to heaven, let your ears perk up. That's you. You live in America for crying out loud. Travel the world. You'll see what I'm talking about. Look at the times the people who wrote the Bible, what they were living in. We're the richest people in the world. So we have to learn to how to be rich. <laughs> Look at the person beside of you and say, you need to learn how to be rich. I mean, go ahead. You need to learn how to be rich. Because you are rich. Go ahead and say, you are rich. I mean... You see, you got to learn to manage these things. So you rationalize and think, well, this don't really matter to me because I'm poor. No, you're not. You live in America. Or you say, well, God just wants me to tithe my time and I need to give my time. Bull. God does want your time, but he says a lot about the other two. So we're going to talk about this because, see, here's what you know. You're smart people. You're smart people. That's why you come to church. You're smart, and you understand things, and you're smart enough to know that just because something's uncomfortable, just because something you don't want to obey, just because something you don't like to talk about, that does not mean you need to stay away from it. Amen. Let, let me just prove it. How many of you have got something in your life that you're ashamed of? Hold your hand up. Good night. That you hope I'd never find out about. You know, whatever, right? There you go, right? Oh, yeah. The rest of it is lying. I'm just preaching a lie right now. Forget money. We've got deeper problems in this congregation. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you, that thing that you're ashamed of, that you hope your spouse, you hope your kids, you hope your preacher, you hope your mom and dad, whoever it is, that you hope never find out, that thing would not have happened if you had been living by the Bible? Anybody else want to raise their hand? Anybody? Is that right? Now, let me ask you this. How many of you, every time you've disagreed with the Bible, as time went on, you found out the Bible was right and you were wrong? Hold your hand up good high. Then why would we think any different about anything? See, so that's the reason, Sally Chapel, we don't stay away from subjects that are uncomfortable. We walk to the uncomfortableness. We step into the crisis. You say, why? Are y'all crazy? Yeah, we kind of are. But 
It's like whenever we're voting on the First Amendment, homosexuality, we step to that and say, what does the Bible say about it? Because we don't want to be a church that's, that's irrelevant. We want to be talking about things that matter. And so I don't want you, here's the deal, if you ignore God's truth about your finances, then you're going to miss a blessing, your kids are going to miss a blessing, your household's going to miss a blessing, and you're going to stand before God and you're going to be like, why didn't Dale tell me? And I don't want that to happen. So I just want to make sure you get the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so to help us God, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Anybody all right with that? If so say amen. amen. Now let me just put you at ease, though. Let's just neutralize the ground. Because I don't want anybody to be like, if I ever get out of here, I ain't never coming back. I mean, here's the deal. I just, I just want you to listen to a few things that maybe hopefully put you at ease right here. Number one, I know, and you don't have a blank for this. This is just things I wrote down. I just wanted to say to you before I, this, we're still in the introduction. All right, here we go, ready? There, uh, <clears throat> number one thing I want to say to you is I know absolutely nothing about your personal finances. Okay? This is not targeted to you. Your banker did not call me and say, Preacher, would you please preach on finances? Because they need it. They all tore up up in there, you know? <laughs> I don't know if the creditors are calling your home and trying to take your home. I don't know how much you make. I don't know if you have all your cards maxed out in credit cards or if you have no debt at all. I know nothing about how much you owe your car. I know nothing at all about your finances. So if the devil starts making you think, he's saying that to me. I know he's talking to me. That's the devil, okay? I know nothing about your finances. I don't want to know anything about your finances, Okay? Everybody understand it? So say yes. yes. Second thing I want you to know is that I don't know anything about what you give to Sandwich Chapel. I chose several years ago. I don't know if I'll always choose this, but this is the way I've chose. I don't want to look at tithing records at the church. I don't want to look at who gives and who don't give. And I, I don't want to know that. And you say, why don't you know that? You're a pastor. Well, here's the reason I don't want to know that. Because number one, I don't want to not preach on something because I'm thinking, well, they don't, I don't want to say something about, I don't want to, I don't want to ever be in a situation of, I can't say what God says about finances because I know they're not doing that and I don't want to say that because I might offend them and they might go away. And like a flip side of that, I don't ever want to need to say something and say, well, I can't say that because they give a lot of money to the church and they may leave the church if I say it. Amen. I just don't want that to ever enter my mind. So I just act like all of y'all give. And I just say whatever I need to say, you know. I'm just, it just works out better. I, I don't know who gives. I don't want to know who gives. So if you will sit there and, mm -hmm, amen, I'll think I'm preaching to the choir. You know what I'm saying? We'll think we're talking to the other people, all right? So you don't, you, nobody ain't giving you away, all right? It's just, it's just when you got. The, the third thing, the third thing I wanted to say here about this is I'm not preaching this because the church is in any kind of financial issues. We're not. God's blessed Stanley Chapel for 30 years. And I'm just going to be honest with you, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant and condescending or anything like that, but Stanley Chapel existed before you. It'll probably exist after you because what God's doing at Stanley Chapel is not about you. Amen. It's about Him and His glory. And he's took care of the church. And I'm proud to tell you, we're one of the few churches that bring in more money each Sunday than we spend, than our budget is. Would you give God a hand clap of praise for that? We are, we, we're, we're extremely conservative financially. We have a very manageable debt. In fact, some of you probably owe more than we owe as a church. God's just, we're very conservative financially, so this is not about any, anything like that. And then the last thing I want to tell you about this before I ever go any further with it is this, is... If you think, because I'm talking about money, that this whole series is how you need to give more money to the church, then you need to read the Bible. The Bible says way more about money than just give to the church. And let me just go against the TV preachers. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? And I, I know none of you are in here. This is for those people who don't come to church, not for you. But for those people who don't come to church, giving, coming in here and becoming a giver is probably not going to be all you need to do to fix your financial mess. And again, none of, I know that's none of y'all, but I'm saying other people, right? <laughs> so, the, the thing is, it, the truth of the matter is, it's not just going to be like you brought a fat check to Sunday Chapel today, and all of a sudden you're going to get a big check in the mail, and everything's going to be all right, and everybody's happily ever after. The Bible says way more about finance. As a matter of fact, let me just go tell you, you're going to probably have to learn some things that's even worse than giving. Giving will be the easiest thing you learn to do. You're going to have to learn self-control. <sighs> You're going to have to learn contentment. Ooh. <laughs> You're going to have to learn discipline. Ouch. Right? <laughs> you see, giving will be the easiest thing. So if you think the only thing the Bible says is you've got to give to be financially healthy, you're wrong, friend. You're going to have to do a lot more than give to get financially healthy. 
So we're going to talk about what the Bible says about finances, but here's what I wanted to do. I wanted you to just take your foot off the brake, relax. I am very comfortable at this stage of my life talking about it because I clearly know what the Bible says. I know we're on the, on the foundation of the Word of God. I am extremely comfortable with this message in this series, and I want you to be comfortable. So I want you to take your foot off the brake, and let's just sit back and learn what the Bible says about money. Now, how many of you will just make a commitment, let me call you out, and say, I will do my best to be here every Sunday in this series, and I won't get scared. Hold your hand up good and high. Yes, I am so glad that you're raising your hand. And I, God's going to minister to you in an incredible way. So let's go. Let's talk about money today, and, and let's talk about how to get there. Now, one more thing I need to say, I had it in my notes, I'm glad I had it in my notes, is we are not going to be able to go very far with only three weeks. There is a lot to be said about money, a lot to be said about finances. But we're not going to have the time to get into all of that in the next three weeks. We do a seminar in the fall of the year by Dave Ramsey. You ever heard of Dave Ramsey? On Fox News and on radio, radio. Yeah. We do a seminar by Dave Ramsey in the fall of the year. He has a lot of resources. If you will, if you need help, you write on your blue card, we need help financially, and I will get our Dave Ramsey representative in touch with you to give you some resources before the fall so that you can make sure that you get your help that you need during this series. Everybody got it? If you got it, say yes. yes. All right, so let's go. Let's talk about, let's, let's get ready to go with this. Now, here's what we do at Sandwich Chapel. We, don't, we ask you not to turn your cell phones off and not to turn your iPads off, but to keep them on because you got some friends at home that need to be in church, right? Say amen. And so we want to post things. If I say anything post-worthy, tweet-worthy, whatever, post it and tweet it during the, during the service. And so we give you a starting point with that. And you can go to our Facebook page and like it and repost it and tweet it and whatever you do with it. But here you go. Here it is. Ready? Here's the face, Sammy Chapel Facebook moment, a social media moment of the day. Ready to get you started? Number one, or it goes in your blank. You can't wholeheartedly follow Christ and remain disobedient financially. So I would start subtle. You cannot wholeheartedly follow Christ and remain disobedient financially. You cannot wholeheartedly say, here I am, Savior, I surrender to you, and then stay lost in the realm of your finances. You cannot say, I love Jesus, yes I do, I love Jesus, how about you? <laughs> and say, I hate that girl. You can't do that. I hate that man. How are you going to say you love Jesus and hate somebody? You cannot selectively pick out parts of the Bible you want to apply to your life. Somebody say amen. amen. You cannot wholeheartedly follow Christ and just say, I'm not going to deal with finances. You know why? Because Jesus just said too much about finances. If you take all the verses that he said about heaven and hell and, and prayer and faith, the verses on money would still outnumber them like twice the amount. In fact, Robert Morris, this is a book I've been reading. I hadn't read about half of it, but I strongly urge you, if you want to know about finances biblically, I've only read about half of it, but I've heard a lot of people talk about it. It's called The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. I encourage you to get it. Jay will be out in the lobby at the end of the service. He can help you order it if you want to order. It's like 13 bucks or so. And, 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 and we'll, we'll help you order. You can go to Amazon.com, go somewhere, buy whatever. It's the blessed life. And he talked. You hear people say, well, I believe Gibbons an Old Testament thing. And I, Hey, he addresses all that squared right head on, right head on. And here's what he says. He says in this book, he says, there is more than 500 verses in the Bible concerning prayer, nearly 500 verses concerning faith. Listen to this. But more than 2,000 verses on the subject of money and possessions. He says, Jesus talked about money in 16 of the 38 parables. So for you to say, I'm not going to deal with money, and money and spirituality don't need to go to me together, and I'm not going to obey God my finances, that's like taking the Bible and ripping out pages after pages about <coughs> half of what Jesus says, and then say, God, I'm going to burn that and throw that away, but here, I want you to bless me, I want you to help bless my family, bless my marriage, bless my kids, bless me. I ain't going to do none of that stuff about money, but bless me, bless me, bless me. You cannot do that. Right? Don't that make sense, everybody? If you're going to say I'm all for Jesus, then you need to be all for Jesus. And we say, what did you say? And let's do what he says. So here's the reason why money is such a spiritual issue. And this is why it's so uncomfortable for everybody. Let's go through it. Ready? Because you blank. 
Why are, why are finances a spiritual issue? Number one, your heart and money are connected. I don't know if you knew that or not. You probably knew it intuitively, but if no one's ever told you. Your heart and your money are connected. For where your treasure is, the Bible says in Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this is not an indictment. This is not something that shouldn't be true. This is just, I mean, it's just something that's true. It's just the truth. It's, you know, people breathe. Birds fly, frogs hop, bunnies hop, cats should die. I mean, what, I mean I'm just kidding. Whatever. It's just a fact of life is all it is. The fact is, wherever your money goes, your heart's going to follow. Last week was Valentine's Day. If you went and bought some hot chick a big Valentine's present, guess what? Your heart's going to follow that. If you buy stock in a company, you don't even know what the company does. What do they do? I think it's something wires. I'm not sure it's the wires. Yes, wires. You don't even know what they do. But you can't, you're watching and you're paying attention to that company. Why? Because where your money goes, your heart's going to follow. And see, the opposite of that's not necessarily true. Where your heart goes, your money don't necessarily follow. For, for instance, you ever watched the TV and saw some need? Those kids or whatever, you think, oh, I'm going to give to that. And you didn't do it? Anybody other than me? I was going to say, woo, y'all are holy. <laughs> you ever seen somebody and think, oh, we need to help them? And then you don't help them? Because you know what? Your heart will not, your money will not follow your heart, but your heart will always follow your money. Now, this is the principle I need you to make sure you get, and I don't have a lot of time, so you got to get it real quick. All right, ready? You, if you, listen, listen. If you want your heart to go to something, you need to send your money there. If your marriage, if your marriage is struggling and your your marriage is not right right now and you feel like your heart's drifting a little bit from your marriage, you need to take the treasures that are inside of you, that whatever you value on this earth, and you need to send those treasures to your spouse because your heart will be put back in that marriage. If you got, hey dads, if you're you might able to have a relationship with your kids and you're way away and whatever else, and you feel bad because sometimes you forget you ain't got kids because you just can't have a relationship. Hey, you need to find a way to send some treasure to those kids and your heart will connect because where your treasure goes, your heart goes. Also, hey, if you're new, a new Christian, let me tell you what Jesus would do to new Christians. Whenever they would come and they would say, what have I got to do to follow you? He would say, go sell everything you've got, give it to God, and there's lots of ways you can give it to God. You can give it to God through the church. You can give it to God through the, give it to the poor. You find a way to funnel your money to God. And then your heart follows. He would say to Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. And Zacchaeus gave everything away. And then he followed. He told the rich young ruler, sell everything you've got and come follow me. But he didn't do it. He went away sorrowful. He missed the opportunity. He told Matthew, give back the money and come follow me. He would tell people, just as soon as you become a Christian, you need to start sending your treasure to God. Now listen, some of you's been you just become a Christian. As a matter of fact, every time somebody gets saved at Stanley Chapel, we put a light right here on this cross. And right now there's 379 lights on this cross. Come on, somebody. <laughs> now let me tell you the best thing you can do. If you're a new Christian and you're like you're sitting here saying, Man, I hope I don't get cold on this Christianity thing. I want to get, I don't want to go back to my own life. I don't want my heart to get away. I want to stay plugged in. God, please, I want to just keep coming to church. I've done this before. I keep coming to church. I leave, I come to church, I leave, I come. I get close to God, then I backslide, then I get close to God. You know what you might not be doing? My chances are high. You've never sent your treasure there. The most stable, committed Christians I know are people who early on started putting their treasure. And when they put their treasure towards God, this is the principle. This is not something that's bunnies hop, frogs jump, wherever you send money, wherever you send your things that are valuable to you, wherever you send your treasure, your heart's going to immediately follow. Not the other way around. Your heart may go to kids, but if you don't put money, you'll forget about those kids. Your heart may go to some other thing, but if you don't put no money to it, your heart will drift. But when you consistently put your treasure there, your heart's going to follow. How many of you got that principle where I need to keep preaching it? Because I can preach that one. You got it. This is the first thing you need to do is you become a Christian. Immediately start getting your treasure to God. Because it'll keep your heart guarded. It'll guard your heart. All right. Number two. Your servanthood and money are connected. Your servanthood and money are connected. Luke 15, 13 says, No servant can serve two masters. 
is that he'll hate, say hate, hate the one and what? Love the other. And he will be, or he will be devoted, say devoted, devoted to the one and what? Despise the other. And then he says you cannot, what's that next word? Serve both God and, hold on, if you didn't know what the next part of that was, and it was filling the blank, what would you want to put? I, 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 what's the opposite of God? The devil. So you would want him to say, you cannot serve both God and the devil. But he did. You know why? Because most of you don't wake up in the morning and say, do I want to serve God or the devil? Hmm. Did you know that the number of atheists keeps going down every year? Because people must know there's a higher power. They, know there's a they may not agree on what God is, but they just know you instinctively know there's God. It's not like you wake up one day and say, do I want to go to church or become a Satan worshiper? Hmm. <laughs> Who does that, you know? But let me, tell you, let, me, let me tell you what you do. You got stuff, right? Come on, somebody. You got stuff and your stuff pulls you away from serving God wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen? So the number one competitor for your heart is not, <laughs> it, 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 it's not a person. It's a thing. It's money and all that that represents. And God says, you can't separate me from money because money is so ingrained in who you are. And you cannot wholeheartedly follow me without surrendering that area of your life. <laughs> so notice those words, hate or love, despise, or devote. That kind of explains what people feel like when you start preaching on money, right? You either get people who hate and despise or people who love and devote. So that's a kind of a good test right now. How are you feeling? <laughs> What's going on? Because and you say, that's kind of hard, Dale. I know. It's hard truth that Jesus taught. But he said, look in the mirror. What kind of emotions is that? Because you can't wholeheartedly serve your Father if you've committed serving everybody else. Here's another example of that. Ready? Proverbs 22, verse 7. And this is this is not be condescending or nothing. It's just it's in the Bible. You don't like to take it up with God when you get to heaven. First, Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the barrier is what? Servant to the lender. So servant to who? To God? No. He's saying, you cannot wholeheartedly serve me because you have willingly signed part of your servanthood over to a bank, to a credit card company, to a lender. You, and you say, well, Dale, you said you shouldn't be in debt. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying every time you sign your name to that, you have signed a slice of your life over that now you have, you're responsible to honor your word. And he's saying, you will put yourself in a bind. And if you're not a Christian and this is all you know about Christianity, you're like, golly, I don't want to be a Christian if that's what being a Christian is. I don't blame you if that's all you know about Christianity. But here's what you need to know about Jesus. Jesus, I don't remember one time, even though he told people to sell everything they've got and all that kind of stuff, I don't know one single verse where Jesus said, give me all your money. I don't know of one verse where he even asked people for money. He won't try to get people's money. He was trying to keep people's money from getting them. Amen. Did you hear me? Because if Jesus wanted your money, Amen. the government does, don't they? <laughs> if, don't you think, is your God smaller than the government? <clears throat> if he wanted your money, he'd be gone tomorrow. You realize that, right? He's not trying to get your money. He's trying to keep your money from getting you. Am I tracking with me? Raise your hand a good night if you understand. So, you, so the, it's connected to your heart. It's connected to your servanthood. And I don't have time for these, these other two because I'm going to get to the last part. So let's do this real quick. It's connected to your anxiety and money are connected. You can read that. You just, I mean, he don't want you worrying about what you're going to wear and where you're going to live. All of a sudden. If you're worried about financial situations, that's time to fix it. You need to get right, man. Number four, your generosity and money are connected. Because love is not selfish. You, you can't be generous to people you know because you're owing too much to people you don't know. You can't give to the people who's in your life that you want to give because you're too busy stretched financially to people, bankers and you know, bankers and candlestick makers and whoever else. I don't know. But you can't, you can't give to God because of that. Now, here's, here's all I'm saying before I move on. All I'm trying to say is you can't divorce these two issues. Money and spirituality are connected. How many of you buying that? You understand it. Raise your hand. If you've got a few holdouts and you're still not sure, they're connected. Let's flip it around. All right? Let's flip it around. Let's say that tomorrow morning you lost everything. 
you lose your job this week, the next week the banker, the next month the bankers are calling, they want your house, next month they want your car, and you're losing everything. It suddenly just became a spiritual issue. Amen? Let me tell you what you do. I know what you do. You say, God, I just give myself to you. I give all of me to you, God. I just surrender it all. And God's like, what you got? You ain't got nothing to surrender. <laughs> I just give all my bad debt and all my poor choices and all my bad credit and all my financial stuff. I give it all to you. I just want you to be in control. And God's like, woohoo, what a sacrifice. <laughs> Why didn't you do that when you had something to give? Because I didn't need it. I didn't need you then. It was all mine then. But now all this bad stuff is yours. I'm giving it to you. Hey, you don't even have, you may not even be a Christian, but come on. If you lost it all, you'd start praying. You'd get real spiritual, wouldn't you? And all I'm saying is this. Why do you want to wait till it? Can you see how self-focused that is, right? Why would you wait till you lose everything before you got serious about this? And why don't you go ahead now and invite God into your financial situation and say, God, I want you to be. You say, Well, how do I invite God to my financial situation? Do I pray? You can pray, but you know what we learn from Scripture is that God just don't want people who run their mouth. Amen. Say, Amen. Amen. He wants people who follow up with obedience. Faith without works is dead. Where you step into faith by saying, I will obey you. You have invited him in. Now here's where I want to end the message here. I just want to take a few minutes. And I, you know, a lot of times preachers preach this and it's because they want something from you. And I don't want, anybody knows me, I don't want anything from you. I just want something for you. And I'm telling you, you will rob yourself if you rob God. You will rob yourself if you don't obey God in finances. You say, I don't like I'm doing too bad. I got a boat and I got a boat. And I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. But I'm just telling you, if you continue to be a greedy little clod, if you continue to not know where your money's going, it will catch up to you, even if it don't catch up to you until you stand before God. He has entrusted money and wealth to you. I don't want anything from you. I just want something for you. In fact, don't even give anything in the offering today if you think I am in any way trying to get anything from you. Don't give it next week either. I don't care. I just want you to walk in the fullness of the blessings of God. Amen. So I hope you feel the passion and the love behind this. And I want to end this sermon by telling you some things I would like to have for you. As your pastor, somebody who loves you, this is why I'm preaching this. These are some things I want for you. Ready? goes in your blank. I want you to experience total devotion. I want you to experience total devotion in every area of your life. You know, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've, I've watched a lot of people, hundreds of people, give their life to Jesus Christ. And you know what I've noticed? People come to this church, and they're like, God, I just give you my marriage. And they're quick to give God their marriage, because, I mean, that's just hard. Can I get a witness? Don't y'all say a word if you sit with your spouse, all right? Anybody else? Amen, right? It's just hard, right? And they'll say, God, I just give you my kids because they're 13 and they need help. And God, I just give you my job because my job is a chaos and I work with a bunch of idiots and there's pagans and then I just don't know if I were, and the market's bad and I just give you my job. But you know what research says? It takes people nine months to really start trusting God with their money. Why? Because we think the money's ours. We think the money is mine. We think the money is, is all about me and I've got that. And it feels like something you can control, but you really can't. And instead of you controlling it, it starts controlling you. Amen. And I'm tired of you having to come to a worship service like this and hear a preacher talk like me and you feel guilt and shame. I want you to feel total devotion. All I have is yours, God. You gave it all for me. And I realize everything I got is yours. Second thing I want for you, this is something I want for you. I want you to experience God's faithfulness. Because trusting God with money is an invitation for him to get involved. And I want you to experience one of those, wow, look at what God did. I prayed and he did it. And y'all have heard stories like that, right? 
I, I mean, I, I've got a bunch of stories from you. I could tell you bunches of stories in here, but I, I mean, I tell you one just from my own life. Here, I remember when I, I grew up in North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, and so just about everybody in here, and, and anybody from North Carolina, most of us from North Carolina, we all had the same first job. We barn backer. Anybody kind of get a witness? Anybody? Yeah, some of you. There you go. And we barn backer, and usually it was for a relative or somebody, and they paid us like 99 cents an hour. I mean, it was child labor, totally illegal, but who cared? We were getting money. And I started when I was like 12 years old, barn and backer, and I remember getting paid nothing. And my dad would make you give. He would say, we're going to give. We're going to give. You're going to give to God. If you earn money, you're going to give. And, and so I, I learned that discipline early. I didn't really like it, but I did it. Even when I was a teenager, and I lived like the devil, I still gave to God because I just somehow felt like that was an invitation for God to bless me. But you know, I never really saw the faithfulness of God until I got out on my own. I bought my second house and I'm living on my own and I had a jet ski, I had a new truck, and I had a house, a new house payment, and all of a sudden, I found myself in a tight spot where I had a whole lot more month at the end of my money than I did money at the end of my month. Can anybody identify with what I'm talking about? And I was in that situation where I had a can of collards to eat and last me all week. And my tires on my truck were bald, worse than my head, bald. And they were, I almost had two or three wrecks, and I knew I needed new tires, and I broke, I mean, I'm talking broke as a convict broke, rolling pennies to eat broke, looking in the couch cushions, pulling them out broke. Come on, somebody. Looking under the car seat broke. Anybody been there? Raise your hand other than me. And I'm in that situation, and I'm, I'm struggling. I mean, I don't know what's going on. And so here I had, I, I needed tires, and I had three options. And, and I don't mean this anyway condescending. I'm just changing the way my family dynamic and the way it works for me. I had three options. I could, I could go to my dad and say, Dad, I, I need money. And I'm just am too proud for that. I ain't going to lie about it. I know some of you, you get help from your family. That's fine. Hey, that's fine. That's your family dynamic. It won't, and my dad, if I asked him, he'd have had it there in you know, just a matter of minutes. But I just... I don't know. My, my mom and dad did what Al all my life for us. And I remember my dad teaching me to play basketball in dress wingtip shoes because he couldn't afford two pair of tennis shoes for me to have a pair and him to have a pair. And so I just, by the time I got 18, I was like, I ain't never asking for nothing because I just don't want him to sacrifice anymore. They've already sacrificed so much for us. And so I just wouldn't do it. So I, I had a credit card. I could have went and got a credit card, but... <laughs> I grew up thinking credit cards were the devil, you know, and I was pretty sure that God would curse you straight to hell if you bought anything on a credit card. Now, I know some of you buy stuff on a credit card. I'm just saying the way I thought at the time. That's the way God, I mean, that's the way my parents taught me. And so I was like, I can't use a credit card. And see, part of my financial struggle was that I had never been on a budget. So I had put myself on this new budget because that's why I couldn't pay my bills because I didn't have a budget. So I put myself on this new budget, and I had money saved up, like, for taxes. And I thought, I could use some of that, and maybe I can get it back in there before the... Man, that's all I need is the government to come up in here. You know, and so I'm like, I'm looking at that thing. I'm trying to figure out where. And there it was. Tithe. I can take that. Pay it back. You know, do interest only with God or something. No money down. Interest only payments or something. I mean, I don't know. He knows I need tires. I think he'd want me to have tires. He don't want me to die in a wreck. I mean, you know, I, 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 all that stuff. And finally, and, and, and I, I hate telling stories like this because I don't want to be like condescending to nobody else there or how you process. Because I know you've all been there, right? Come on, somebody. Y'all so holy. Some of y'all ain't ever looked at your tithe money and thought I'm giving that. Anyway, don't y'all judge me in front of this. Anyway, here you go. So we're, well, I, I'm reading this thing and I'm looking at it. And I'm like, all right, God, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to trust you. All my life I've been told you're trustworthy, and I've never really needed you, but I need you now. And I'm just going to pray about this thing. I'm writing this tithe check, and I'm not taking the tax money, and I'm not asking my dad, and I'm not putting on credit card, and I'm just going to die if you want me to die. I'm going on. Eat my collards and be happy. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> So I, I'm just, that's, that's, you know, that's where I'm going. And in about a week's time, I'm telling you no lie. Some of you think I'm lying to you. you know, I'm really not. In my, and I didn't tell anybody because I'm too proud to tell anybody. Nobody knew anything of this. There was a $500 check in my box, a certified check from a local bank, and to this day, I have no clue who put it there. Yeah. But I know who's behind it. You've got to have that. I know who's behind it. It was God behind it. I know who was behind. I don't know who gave it. And I know who my parents. They never knew about it. If they didn't know I only had collars, they'd have come unglued. They didn't know nothing about none of that. Matter of fact, they listened to my sermons online. He's probably going to flip his wig listening to this right now. <laughs> this is the, this is, 
I, I don't know who gave it, but I know somebody did. You know, it's great to read the Bible and say, wow, look at what God did for Moses, and look at what God did for Joshua, and look at what God did for you know, Matthew, and look at what God did for Paul. But when you can look at your life and say, look at what God did for Dale, and look at what God did for Randy, and look at what God did for Brenda, and you can put your name in there, and then I'm telling you, I want you to experience that. I don't want you just to read about how God did great things for somebody else. I, as your pastor, am begging you to obey God in your finances because I want you to say, God did something for me. I want you to have that. I want you to experience His faithfulness. I want you to experience His the total devotion. Number three, I want you to experience freedom. Because there's, there's going to be a time in your life when God's going to slide up beside of you and He's going to say, I want you to give to that family right there financially, and you're going to be like, okay. And God's going to flip up the side of you and say, hey, I want you to take a day off of work. There's a death in the church family, and I want you to go serve that church family. And you're going to be like, I can't because i I got to have the money. If I don't work, I don't get paid, and I'm just one paycheck away from failure. He's going to slide up the side of you and say, hey, I want you to take a mission trip. And you're going to say, I don't have the money. I can't go, and I don't... I can't get the time off of work because if I miss one paycheck, no. I won't. <coughs> and so what's going to happen is you're going to have to keep saying no to God and you're going to miss these incredible opportunities and then you're going to, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss what it's like to be on a mission field and see some kid who you led to the Lord. And you're going to miss what it's like to be able to take work off and be able to minister to some grieving family and that family just hug you and say, thank you for ministering to me in my tough time. And you're going to miss what it feels like to hand some kids Christmas presents. Because you wouldn't obey God in this area of your life. And you never would have the freedom. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand if you understand this. Fourth, I, I want you to experience security. I want you to experience security. Feeling secure happens whenever you get rid of debt and you can save and you're spending. It's not necessarily when you have lots of money because you know what? A lot of you make lots of money, but you, you do not have security. You don't have, have... Making a lot of money and feeling secure are two separate things. Security is whenever you don't spend everything you make. Because our culture says devour everything you've got and then whenever you devour everything you've got, go borrow money and devour more. Because see, let me tell you what I know about most Americans. Ready? Here it is. Your income goes up and when your income goes up, you say, oh, we better catch up with our lifestyle. The income goes up, catch up with my lifestyle. We got to raise, get some more cable. Got to raise, get a house. Got to raise, get another car. We got to hurry. We don't want that income to get too high. We got to keep that lifestyle coming right behind it, right? And then what happens after a while? You start getting higher and you're spending 110% of what you make. I don't care if you make $100,000 a year. If you're spending 110, that's a problem. You, you know what this is called? Whenever your income goes up and your expenses and lifestyle stays the same? It's called security. It's called freedom. It's called peace. It's called sleep all night. If you'll be real quiet with people, you'll watch them. See, that's why some of you, you made $20,000 a year and you felt pressure. You made $30,000 a year you feel pressure. You made $40,000 you feel pressure. You made $50,000 you still feel pressure. Your household now between you and your spouse, y'all are making almost $100,000 a year and you've never felt more financial pressure than you're feeling right now. You know why? Because your lifestyle has chased your income. And you're, I, I, don't, want you, I don't want to see you like that. As your pastor, I just love you too good for that. I don't want you to be like, I want you to have freedom, security, peace. You tracking with me? Everybody still with me? The fifth thing I'm praying for you during this series, and I'm praying for you, is I want you to experience contentment. I want you to be content because a big part of the discontentment is what's driving our financial situation, and this is unquenchable thirst for stuff. You know, if I told you this was a magic button right here, that if you come up here at the end of this service and push it, you will have contentment. That was easy. <laughs> if I told you that if you will walk up here, I'm going to put it right here on this thing, and you will walk up to this altar and pray a prayer and push the button, 
that you're going to go home and your neighbor's going to come home and he's going to have a TV that Lowe's had to deliver because nobody has a truck that big. <laughs> and they bring that TV in or whatever, Sears has a, or Best Buy has to deliver, and they need you to help them because get in the house because it's so huge. You will be able to look at that TV and say, that is awesome. I'm so happy you got it. But I'm good with mine. That you'll be able to walk by somebody with the newest iPad or iPhone or iPod or I don't care, whatever, and you go right there, you be able to walk right past that and you be able to say, that is so great, but I'm good, I don't need it. That you ladies, that you can walk down the mall and you know how you walk in the mall and stuff's cried out to you, buy me, buy me, you look horrible, your stuff is so out of date. That you'd be able to walk by and look at that stuff and say, man, I am so glad for the people we have that can create stuff like that, but I'm good. This is going to come back. <laughs> so if I told you if you push this button, that's going to happen to you, would you push it? The sun is like, I'm not sure. <laughs> Don't be too loud. Everybody's going to know, all right? <laughs> trying to keep this anonymous, all right? <laughs> we, we, you, you definitely, you definitely, some of you, you might not push it for yourself say, I don't think so because I don't really have much wants of the stuff I want. You really should want because I really want it. But I'm going to tell you what you do. You bring your wife and you bring your kids. You don't push the button. I will break your hand if you don't push that button. <laughs> because the people you support, you want them to be content, right? Even if you're not content. Hey, you know, it's not all your fault. There's people with master's and doctorate degrees in marketing that sit in a room all day long, uh, total their whole day is spent trying to make you discontent with what you have so that you want to buy what they want to sell you. And they're really good at their job, amen? <laughs> and I don't have a problem with marketing, or some of you do that for a living, and we like, to, well, I like marketing. I'm a business background. I just want, as your pastor, I want y'all to be immune to it. I just want you to be I don't want the discontentment to infect you and your family. I want you to be able to, you know, I, I, hey, you know, you go, I want you to be able to walk by somebody's couch and they're like, wow, look at their couch. There's nine. Mine's got like sippy cup stains and chocolate and milk and the cat threw up. And the, you know, I want you to be happy and say, you know what, maybe one day, but right now I don't have, hey, oh man, how about this? You know, somebody the other day, I smelled their car. You ever smell anybody's new car? <laughs> See, they can put new, new car smells, but they don't smell like new car. You can't get nothing past the real thing, right? I smell that. Smell that thing, it just makes you. See, my truck smells like family. That's all I'm going to say. But it just smells like, I want some of that. I just want you to be able to do that and say, no, you know, I'm good. I'm, I want you to experience contentment. And it's not that I don't want you to have nice things. I hope all of you get a new car by the end of the month. I hope all of you get to upgrade your house. I just want you to have margin. Say amen. Amen. Now here's your homework. And this ain't, you might not seem too spiritual, but here's your homework. Ready? I want you to track and categorize your spending. During this series, maybe for the next two months, I want you to track it and categorize it. Now, how do you track it? You can do it. I use Quicken. You buy a Quicken program or go just get a Walmart bag and hang it on the, on the uh, doorknob and put all your receipts in there and then sit down and put it in categories and use graph paper. I don't care how you do it, but find a system. I'm not talking about a budget. You ain't got to be on a budget yet. I ain't talking about budgets. I'm just saying know where your money's going. Because the very first thing for you to get financially healthy is you need to know where your money's going. And for you, to, the number one thing people say to me whenever I say, where's your money going? They're like, I just don't know where it went. And I'm like, whose fault is that? Did somebody knock you on the head when you got home and gave you amnesia? If you don't know, hey, can you imagine me sitting down with somebody, whoever's managing my mutual fund, and say, hey, I want to know where my money went. I don't know. We just don't keep track of stuff. I just don't know where it all went. I would fire their tail. Can you imagine a CPA or a bank? You go and sit down and say, where's my money? I don't really know. We, just, we, don't, we ain't real good at keeping track of stuff. I don't know. Listen, your money is God's money. He gave it to you to manage. You're managing God's money. And listen to me. Please listen to me. I know we're getting out to the end of some movement around. Please try not to move around just for a second if we can. God ought to fire some of our tail. 
the way we tried. You would fire somebody that took care of your money like this, wouldn't it? All I'm saying, you say, if some of you nerds, y'all going to be like, oh, I love this man. I love this church. I'm going home and we're going to do it. And some of you is going to do it. And some of you is going to need marriage counseling at the end of the week. Some of you is a free-spirited person and you're like, I'm kind of a laid-back type deal. This don't, I don't think I want to do this one. I'm more of a free-flowing, artsy kind of guy, kind of gal. That's, uh, that's not really the way God made me. I don't do I don't even mow my grass the same. I just kind of free. <laughs> hey, I'm glad you're like that. We benefit from you. But you know what? In some arenas of your life, you have to harness that and learn to discipline yourself. Can you imagine writing a letter to Central Electric Membership to, or Progress Energy, whoever you're on, and saying, y'all want me to pay every month? I'm not really a once a month kind of person. <laughs> I'm more free-flowing and artsy. and I'll, I'm cre I'll decorate the envelope. I'll color the envelope before I send it in. But I'm just not a once a month. You know what? They're going to say, be free-flowing and artsy and color in the dark. <laughs> Got to harness that thing, baby. And that's all I'm saying is you need to harness this thing and get it down. This is a very spiritual exercise. I don't care. You say, well, yeah, we don't really need to have any budget. we got plenty of money. If you make $200,000 a year, you will never, if you get a system on how to track and categorize your budget, you will never regret it. I'm telling you, you won't regret it. You'll be shocked at where your money's going because see, here's the deal. Every day, this is something that should be no mystery. You should know where it's going at all times. Because my money don't go unless I tell it to go. I say, hey, go over there and buy me a cup of coffee. Go over there and give me a, give me a burger. Go over there and give me some electricity. I, I tell my money where it's going to go. You're, you're telling your money where to go. So just find out where you're telling it to go. That's all I'm asking you to do. You will never regret it if you do this. Everybody understand? All right. We've had a lot of fun today. A little different kind of sermon. I mean, you're going to come back. You're going to come back. All right. Let me tell you what you're going to come back for. Next week, I'm going, to talk about, I'm going to talk about some real practical suggestions on how to just live God's way so you can create that buffer, okay? Then the week after that, I am going to talk about giving. And you've probably never heard a pastor or a church talk about it. We're working on some things now. I want to release it, but I can't release it because I'm, just, I'm not ready to release it. But I'm telling you, you need to come back the last Sunday of this series. you probably never heard a church do what this church is going to do on that Sunday. I'm telling you, don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's going to be an opportunity. Okay? Now, here's why I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this because, from a church perspective, I already told you why I wanted, what I wanted for you and all that kind of stuff, but let me just add one more. I don't know if y'all have noticed, but God's got his hand on Stanley Chapel in an incredible way. Y'all notice that? He's going to give us more opportunities. We just went from... In flip of one Sunday, we went from a church of 250 people in December to a church of 375 people in January. And here, here's what's going to happen. God's going to give us an opportunity to change this county. And there's 379 lights, and every one of you who give financially, when you get to heaven, one of them lights are going to come up to you and they're going to say, thank you. I'm here because you contributed. And there's going to be some of you who's going to take off work and you're going to be able to be with that family when they have a death in the family. And some of you is going to, we're going to God's going to give us a door. We might go on a mission trip one day and we're going to go. And you know what I'm afraid? If you don't start getting God in your finances, you can't give, you can't take off work. You won't be going on a mission trip, and you watch the glory of God walk past you, wishing you could be a part. I don't want you to. I don't want you to be a part of it. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to get to heaven and be like. I knew that TV won't that important. I knew a new car won't that important. I knew the new game station won't important. I knew I needed to give something. I knew I needed to. I don't want you to be in that position. And if you don't trust us, then that's fine. Don't give it here. Give it somewhere. But you need to. I don't want you to miss it. You understand? Raise your hand if you understand. Stand with me, please.
God, I thank you for who you are. And I pray nobody feels guilt and condemnation and shame or nothing like that. I, because here's the great thing about God. He can care less about where you've been. <laughs> Isn't that great? He just wants to know where you're going. This is not about condemning the past. This is about motivating you for the future. So would you pray this prayer? Would you say, God, do a work in my heart and let me see money as you see money. Let's pray this prayer. This altar is open.